Hello and howdy, my dear listeners. I hope you are doing fantastic. I really do hope you are doing fantastic. I hope you're having a great day. Uh, I hope you're enjoying your Monday. This will be posted on Monday, so, you know, I can say that. That said, hey, look, I noticed it's Monday. Uh, So being a Monday, that means this is a single story from the No Sleep subreddit, or just a general single horror fiction story. And as always, if there is any harsh language, uh, any graphic imagery, I will not be censoring it for the sake of the art. So just a fair warning, viewer discretion advised, etc, etc, etc. You get the point here at this point. That all said, the name of the story is, We were invited to a school reunion, but the GPS took us to a graveyard. Uh, And I like the story. I like all my stories, but I really do like the story. And I hope you enjoy the story as well. So with that said, enjoy. In light of the outcome, I wouldn't say that this is a scary story per se. Sure, some terrifying and unforgettable things happened, but in the end, they were all for the better. I have always loved drawing. Ever since I can remember, it was the first thing anyone said I was good at. Throughout my school years, I would draw portraits of friends or draw pictures of their favorite cartoon characters. Sometimes I would even do them in exchange for sweets or some coins, which I would then spend at the school canteen. In my senior years of high school, I even won some local competitions and had my picture on display at local art festivals. This all changed, however, when I finished school and entered university. Under the insistence of my parents and teachers, art was not a guaranteed way to make a living for a young woman in this day and age. So I gave up my hopes of becoming a children's book illustrator and instead enrolled in an accounting course at Sheffield University. By the end of my first year, I had decided that I hated it. The career opportunities were good and there was the prospect of working abroad, but I found the subject dull and uninspiring. But under the weight of expectation, I felt I had no choice but to stick to it. I still drew though, but it felt like nothing more than clutching at a pipe dream. At the time, I was living alone in a small one bedroom flat in town. One day, after returning home, I saw my home phone had a message on its answering service. The message I heard would change the course of my life for good. North Sheffield Primary School Reunion, Saturday the 22nd, 4 p.m. That's all it said. The line sounded very bad, staticky, and the voice was flat. It was a girl's voice. Through the static, the voice sounded very young, kind of like a child. Of course, at the time, I paid this no mind but was instead filled with joy and excitement at the prospect of seeing all my old classmates. Soon after on that same night, I called Stacy. She and I went to the same primary school and on to the same secondary school. We still kept in touch. Yeah, she said, I got it too. I asked if she intended on going. Absolutely, I wouldn't miss that, she said. We talked for a while and I learned that she had recently acquired her driver's license. She said she could rent a car and we could go together on the 22nd. Nah, this suited me just fine, and we made plans. Stacy picked me up around 2 in the afternoon of the 22nd. We spent the trip talking about old friends and times, and we each grew a little melancholy at hearing how much of our lives had changed since then. Our trip took us deep into the wooded mountain, the sun barely shimmering through the thick trees in the late autumn light. Still, it felt good to be going to this reunion. Whose idea was this? I asked her, recalling the childlike voice on the answering machine. The phone call I got didn't announce who it was. Same, Stacy replied. Mine just said the date and time and then gave the address. Funny, I thought. Mine just gave the date and time. Oh, here we are, said Stacy. The GPS beeped and announced our arrival. The road was a dead end. On one side, the land rose steep into the mountain ridge. On the other was a decrepit church. We looked at each other and got out. This has to be the wrong place, I remember Stacy saying. At first, I thought the reunion might have been held in the church, but it was too old and looked to have been uninhabited for decades. It was surrounded by a graveyard, tombstones jutted from the long grass like rotted teeth from the mouth of a decaying corpse. Let's go back to the turnoff and try again, I suggested. The GPS might be wrong. Around 20 minutes later, the GPS announced our arrival in the exact same place. I'll try calling the rental company, Stacy said in the hope that they could somehow remotely fix any abnormality in the GPS system. She hung up the phone without saying a word. There's no reception up here, she said. I tried with my phone too, but no success. 
It was past 4pm and the light was fading. Our only other option if we wanted to attend the party before it finished was to head back into town and ask for directions. We drove for what seemed like way too long, each bend in the mountain road looking identical to the last. The road seemed to rise in places, fall in others, but we didn't seem to be making any progress toward town. We soon grew despondent. Do you just want to leave? Stacy asked wearily. She looked tired from driving and making it nowhere. A wave of disappointment fluttered over me. In the midst of a thoroughly unfulfilling and lonely academic lifestyle, I thought this event would be just what I needed. <sighs> I guess, I resigned. It's already 5.30. The early dusk light of the mountains made me feel claustrophobic. After a few letters of silence passed, Stacy asked, Plus, don't you think it's weird that there was no letter with the call? I mean, for a reunion, there's usually an announcement in the mail. She continued, suddenly looking quite uncomfortable. Who was it that called, anyway? She asked. She stopped the car on the side of the road and took out her phone. This is the message I got, she said as she passed me the phone. Is that the same voice? Do you know who it is? I pressed the playback button. Sheffield North Primary School Reunion. Saturday 22nd. 4 p.m., it said. Yeah, that's the same as mine, but I don't know the voice of... I was cut off by a sudden violent burst of static through the phone. There was a voice behind the static. It was very faint. We both heard it, but we couldn't make out what it was saying. The message didn't continue like this before, Stacy told me. I shook my head in agreement. The static stopped and the voice became clear. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts. It was the same voice as before, as if on a loop. It sounded mechanical and devoid of any emotion, almost robotic. What is that? Stacy cried. The fear in her expression was palpable. I don't know. Panic rose in my voice. I can't turn it off. I mashed the hang-up icon and the off button, but it wouldn't respond. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts. Stacy snatched her phone from my hands and started clawing at the battery case on the back. It hurts. It hur she ripped the battery from the phone and tossed both into the back seat. We sat there for a few moments, trying to process what had just happened. Our shoulders heaved, our lungs breathless with panic and fear. We leaned back in our seats. What... What was that? She asked between breaths. Let's just get out of here. This is this is too weird, I said. We sat like that for a few more minutes, trying to regain our composure. The forest on either side was no longer visible past the first few meters or so of trees. Beyond that, just a swamp of branches and leaves. I turned my head to look out the passenger side window and saw her immediately. There was a girl, very young, wearing a white one-piece gown standing within the murk of the trees just beyond the side of the road opposite the car. Through the matted strands of dark hair covering her face, she was looking straight at us. Dumbstruck and paralyzed with fear, I swatted Stacy on the arm, never taking my eyes off the girl in the trees. I felt Stacy turn to look out the window too. I didn't see her reaction to what I was looking at, but I heard it. She whimpered. Then, we both heard it again. Not from the phone this time, but from a very close distance, perhaps even inside our heads. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts. We both flinched and screamed. The girl started to walk toward us with nightmare slowness, the voice getting louder with her every step. Stacy scrambled for the keys in the ignition and wrenched them on. The engine turned over once, twice, and, and fell dead. Stacy whimpered again. The girl was now close enough to make out several gashes in the chest of her gown. Through the tears could be seen long, dark cuts, gnarled and dried hard with red and black blood, and dark purple bruises, strangle marks ran across either side of her neck. Her eyes looked tired, desperate. Stacy and I were both screaming. I, I covered my ears and bent over, but I could still hear it. It hurts. It hurts. The car mercifully sprang to life and with a screech of rubber on asphalt sped off. We were a mess of quivering sobs, tears, and burning lungs. The voice had stopped, but we did not slow down. Not even for the stop sign at the foot of the mountain where its winding road meets the main road into town. We stopped at the first rest spot we came across and sat in the car in the car park. Stacy was the first to speak. Should we call the police? She asked. I nodded. We might have to. What else can we do? She slumped forward, resting her head on the steering wheel and sighed long and deep. I suggested we may have to use the rest stop's phone because mine showed no reception. Stacy then reached over her seat to retrieve her phone and battery off the floor. She hesitated before touching it. She seemed repulsed by it. Instead, she picked up the photo album on the back seat. We had flipped through it on the way, trying to remember old names and faces. 
I wonder if there was even any reunion in the first place. She mused aloud as she opened the album to a random spread of photos. I glanced over at a few of the photos. It was like a punch right in the heart. Emily, I said. Huh? It was Emily. Who's Emily? I pointed to a girl in the back row of one of the class group photos. A look of recognition bled across Stacy's face. That was her, I said. It was definitely her. Emily, Stacy thought. But she died, right? In the sixth grade? In fact, Emily had been killed by her mother in a murder-suicide, strangled and then stabbed to death. We didn't call the police, and instead decided on paying a visit to Emily's father, whom we hoped still lived in the same house in North Sheffield. We sat in silence during the drive back. We were both thinking the same thing, but neither one of us dared to say it. Emily's childhood home stood where it did eight years ago. A car was parked in the driveway, and there was lights on inside. Stacy turned off the engine, and we sat in the dark, opposite the house. What are we even going to say, she asked, a hint of hopelessness in her voice. To be honest, I didn't know. How can we tell a man who, in all sense, is probably still grieving the loss of his 11-year-old daughter at the hands of his ex-wife that we had just seen her hours ago on a deserted mountain road? But for some reason, this felt like the right thing to do. He could call us insane or accuse us of playing a sick joke, but nevertheless, I felt that we had to tell him. A middle-aged woman wearing an apron answered the door. Good evening, yes, she said, wiping her hands down the front of the apron. I clumsily blurted out the first intelligible thing that came to mind. Uh, good evening, um, is the father of a girl who was named Emily living here? The woman first eyed us suspiciously, then told us to wait while she got him. The three of us sat in the living room, chatting idly. Photos of Emily adorned the walls and shelves. The woman who greeted us at the door came in with tea. I've since remarried, he said. He looked very old, but seemed to be in good spirits. We told him that we were invited to a reunion, which was to be held on Mount Blackmore. His eyes lit up. That's where my Emily is, he paused, sleeping, now. Stacy and I eyed each other numbly. There's a small church up there. Emily's grandmother, my mother, is buried there too, he said, smiling warmly. Lovely views out over the whole valley on a nice day. I pretended to sip the tea. How was the reunion then? He continued. Stacy and I shared another glance at each other. Oh, I said, we never made it in the end. Yes, Stacy added. We got lost on the way up and, um, oh my, he said, that is a shame, isn't it? There's nothing like a good school reunion to lift the spirits. Neither one of us were willing to tell him what had actually happened and how we saw his daughter, the state she appeared to us in. I thought of a ruse. We had been thinking about Emily, and actually we came here to give you a present, I told him. Oh, you did? He beamed. How lovely, but you, you really didn't have to come all this- Stacy, I said, putting down my tea. Do you think you could go out and get the photo album from the car? She seemed more than happy to. As she left the room, he got up and started for the living room door. Actually, I've got something you might like to see too, he said. I felt the fool. The poor man, I thought. Stacy returned with the album, and Emily's father came back into the room holding what looked like a large scrapbook. She kept all of these, he said, opening the book on the table. The pages were filled with sketches stuck there with glue. I recognized some as my own. I used to sign my name on them. She loved your drawings, he said, smiling warmly at the sketches. Do you still draw? He asked me. Well, I began. I've not got much time with my studies and all, but when I can find the time, I try to. And so you should, he shouted. Don't waste a talent like this. He rubbed his hand over a portrait I drew of Emily. His eyes softened. Stacy gave him the photo album, but he refused to accept it, as did I when he offered me the portrait of Emily. Feeling we had more than overstayed our welcome, we headed back out to the car. I lay awake in my flat that night. I kept thinking about the reason Emily would have revealed herself like that to me. What was she trying to tell me? A few days later, I announced to the dean that I was taking a year off from my courses to pursue other interests. I like to believe that Emily revealed herself in order for me to realize what I really wanted to do with my life. I enrolled at a visual arts college in London, where I'll be doing what I love for the next 10 months at least. And then I, I guess I'll see where it leads. Well, there you have it, dear listener, a fantastic story. Fairly terrifying story, but in a in a fantastic way, right? It was it was scary, but at the same time, kind of uplifting. Uh, minus the you know um, spirit of the girl screaming or not screaming, but saying it hurts, it hurts, it hurts over again. That's 
That kind of gave me chills. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did enjoy, please consider giving it a thumbs up, liking it. Uh, that helps way more than you'll ever know. If you enjoy my narrations, consider subscribing. That tells me that you like what I do. And if you are really feeling bold, consider leaving me a comment. Uh, I would love to hear from you. Please, however, do not leave a comment that just says it hurts over and over again. Please don't do that. Um, yeah, I hope you have a fantastic day. I hope you find it in yourself to do whatever you love on this wonderful Monday. I hope you don't need someone like Emily to show up to you in order to push you in the right direction. Try to, um, try to embrace your dreams without the spirit of a child making you drive to a cemetery on a mountain in the middle of the afternoon. Yeah, just don't, yeah, just avoid that altogether. Just avoid that altogether. Go, just do, do what you love. Do what you love. Be you. Love yourself. Love everyone around you. Embrace the love. I don't know what I'm trying to say here. Just be happy. And I hope you guys have a fantastic time. And until the next time, sleep well.